Chapter Twenty Five of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter Twenty Five. The Duel Delayed. Full five minutes passed, and not one of the vultures showed signs of stirring. Five minutes of prolonged and terrible suspense. It was odd that the birds had not at once swooped down upon the piece of venison, since it lay conspicuously upon the ground, almost under the tree where they were perched. A score of them were there, ranged along the dead limbs, each with an eye keen of sight as an eagle's. Beyond doubt they observed the object. They would have seen it a mile off, and recognized it too. Why, then, were they disregarding it? A circumstance so contradictory of their natural instincts and habits that even in the dread hour i remarked its singularity the cause might have been simple enough perhaps the birds had already glutted themselves elsewhere some wild beast of the woods more likely some strain ox had fallen a victim to disease and the summer heats and his carcass had furnished them with their morning's meal there was evidence of the truth of this in their blood-stained beaks and gorged maws as also the indolent attitudes in which they roosted many of them apparently asleep others at intervals stretched forth their necks and half spread their wings but only to yawn and catch the cooling breeze not one of all the listless flock showed the slightest disposition to take wing there were several already in the air wheeling high aloft and two or three had just joined their companions increasing the cluster upon the tree these had arrived after we had taken our stand and others were constantly coming down but the signal mutually agreed to was mutually understood it was the departure of one of the birds not its arrival that was to give the cue of entree to the tragic act the signal for the scene of death those five minutes to me appeared fifty ah, far more than that for brief as was the actual time a world of thoughts passed through my mind during its continuance the past and future were alike considered the memory of home kindred and friends the probability that all such ties were to be severed now and for ever some regret that laurels lately won were to be so briefly worn the near prospect of life's termination of a death inglorious perhaps scarcely to be recorded vague visions of a future world doubts not unmingled with dread about the life to come such were the thoughts that whirled confusedly through my brain and the proximate past had also its share in my reflections perhaps occupying the largest space of all that thing of light and gold that but an hour ago had filled my heart to overflowing was still there mingling with its last emotions was i never more to look upon that radiant form never more behold that face so divinely fair never more listen to that melodious voice never more the negative answer to these mental interrogatives though only conjectural was the bitterest reflection of all still stir not the vultures only to preen their black plumes with fetid beak or extending their broad wings to shadow the sunbeam from their bodies it is the hour of noon and the sun shining down from the zenith permeates the atmosphere with its sultriest rays the birds droop under the extreme heat it imbues them with a listless torpor carrion itself would scarce tempt them from their perch five minutes have elapsed and not one moves from the tree neither to swoop to the earth nor soar aloft in the air i no longer wish them to tarry the suspense is terrible to endure the more so from the ominous stillness that reigns around since the last angry challenge not a word has been exchanged between my adversary and myself in sullen silence we eye each other with scintillating glances watching for the signal the situation was more than unpleasant i longed for the finale my antagonist also showed signs of impatience no longer preserving his statue-like pose his body began to sway from side to side while at intervals he stamped the ground with his heavy heel from the increasing anger that betrayed itself in his looks i expected an explosion it came at length darn them buzzards cried he with a hurried gesture they're going to keep us a standing here till sundown darn the sleepy brutes can't wait no longer on em i dare you the challenge thus commenced was never completed at all events i did not hear its conclusion and know not to this hour what he meant to have proposed his speech was interrupted and his voice drowned by the shrill neighing of my horse who seemed startled at some sound from the forest 
almost at the same instant i heard a responsive neigh as if it were an echo from behind me i heeded neither the one nor the other i saw that the birds were aroused from their lethargic attitude some of them appeared as if pressing upon their limbs to spring upwards from the tree the deadly moment had come with my rifle raised almost to the level i glanced rapidly toward my antagonist his piece was also raised but to my astonishment he appeared to be grasping it mechanically as if hesitating to take aim his glance too showed irresolution instead of being turned either upon myself or the vultures it was bent in a different direction and regarding with fixed stare some object behind me i was facing round to inquire the cause when i heard close at hand the trampling of a horse and almost at the same instant an exclamation uttered in the silvery tones of a woman's voice this was followed by a wild scream and simultaneously with its utterance i beheld a female form springing over the bars it was that of a young girl whom i recognized at a glance it was she i had encountered in the forest i had not time to recover from my surprise before the girl had glided past me and i followed her with my eyes as she ran rapidly over the space that separated me from the squatter still mute with surprise i saw her fling herself on the breast of my antagonist at the same time crying out in a tone of passionate entreaty father dear father what has he done mercy oh mercy good god her father holt her father oh wait a little cried the man in a peremptory tone removing her arms from his neck oh hey, girl get you from here no father dear father you will not what does it mean what has he done why are you angry with him done girl she's called me coward and would drive us out of house and home get you gone i say into the house with you away mercy oh father have mercy do not kill him he is brave he is beautiful if you knew brave beautiful girl you're raving what do you know about him you've never seen him afore yes dear father only an hour ago if you but knew it was he who saved me but for him father he must not he shall not die saved you what do you mean girl Lou, what's all this rumpus the familiar ejaculation and its adjunct interrogatory admonished me that a new personage had appeared upon the scene the voice came from behind on turning i beheld the unexpected speaker a man on horseback who had ridden up to the bars and having halted there was craning his neck into the enclosure gazing upon the scene that was being enacted there with a singular half comic half satirical expression of countenance end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 26. The Peacemaker. Without knowing why, I hailed the arrival of this stranger as opportune. Perhaps his presence, added to the entreaties of that fair young creature, still urgent in my behalf, might prevent the effusion of blood. Indeed, I had already determined that none should be spilled by me, let the consequences be as they might and whatever was to be the denouement of this awkward affair, I had resolved that my rifle should have naught to do in deciding it. The peace had fallen to the order arms, the ill-omened birds had forsaken their perch, and now, soaring in the blue sky almost beyond the reach of human vision, their movements were no longer heeded, neither by my adversary nor myself. Turning away from the stranger, whom I had only regarded for a second or two, I faced again to the more interesting tableau in front of me, that too was rapidly undergoing a change the squatter no longer clung to his rifle the girl had taken it from his hands and was hurrying with it to the door of the cabin there was no hindrance made by my antagonist on the contrary he appeared to have delivered it over to her as if the affair between us was to have a pacific determination or at all events a respite what surprised me more than all was the altered demeanour of my adversary his whole manner seemed to have undergone a sudden change sudden it must have been since it had taken place during a second or two while my attention was occupied by the newly arrived horseman what still further astonished me was that this transformation was evidently produced by the presence of the stranger himself that it was not due to the young girl's interference i had evidence already that had not moved him for a moment 
her earnest appeal had received a repulse energetic and decisive as it was rude and of itself would certainly not have saved me beyond doubt then was i indebted to the stranger for the truce so unexpectedly entered upon the change in holt's demeanour was not more sudden than complete at first an air of astonishment had been observable after that an expression of inquietude becoming each moment more marked no longer did he exhibit the proud aspect of a man who felt himself master of the ground but on the contrary appeared cowed and quailing in the presence of the newcomer whom he had met at the entrance and at once invited into the enclosure this manner was observable in the half-mechanical courtesy with which he removed the bars and took hold of the stranger's horse as also in some phrases of welcome to which he gave utterance in my hearing for myself i was no longer regarded any more than if i had been one of the deadwoods that stood around the clearing the squatter passed without even looking at me his whole attention seemingly absorbed by the new arrival it was natural i should regard with curiosity an individual whose presence had produced such a wonderful effect and my scrutinizing gaze may have appeared rude enough to him i cannot say that he elicited my admiration on the contrary his appearance produced an opposite effect i beheld with him what might be termed an instinct of repulsion since i could assign no precise reason for the dislike with which he had inspired me on sight he was a man of about thirty years of age a thin spare body less than medium height and features slightly marked with the bar sinister a face without beard skin of cadaverous hue nose sharply pointed chin and forehead both receding eyes small but sparkling like those of a ferret and long lank black hair thinly shading his cheeks and brows were the prominent characteristics of this man's portrait his dress was of a clerical cut and colour though not of the finest fabric the coat trousers and vest were of black broadcloth the coat and waistcoat being made with standing collars similar in style to those worn by wesleyan ministers or more commonly by catholic priests while a white cravat not over clean and a hat with curving boat brim completed the saintly character of the costume judging from his personal appearance i concluded that i saw in the individual before me the methodist minister of swampville if so it would account for the obsequiousness of his host though not satisfactorily there was something more than obsequiousness in holt's manner something altogether different from that deferential respect with which the gospel minister is usually received in the houses of the humbler classes moreover the character of the squatter such as i had heard it and such as i had myself observed it to be for no correspondence with the attitude of reverence he had so suddenly assumed even under the hypothesis that the newcomer was his clergyman i was puzzled by his behaviour he in the ecclesiastical costume appeared to be a man of few words and of gesture he made a like limited use having passed me without even the courtesy of a bow on the contrary i was honoured with a glance of cynical regard so palpable in its expression as to cause an itching in my fingers notwithstanding the saintly gown i contented myself however with returning the glance by one i intended should bear a like contemptuous expression and with this exchange we separated from each other i remained by my stand without offering remark either to the squatter or his guest the only change i effected in my position was to sit down upon the stump where with my rifle between my knees i resolved to await the issue all idea of using the weapon was gone out of my mind at least against hickman holt he was her father i would as soon have thought of turning its muzzle to my own body i tarried therefore with no hostile intention on the contrary i only waited for an opportunity to propose some pacific arrangement of our difficulty and my thoughts were now directed to this end i had every chance of observing the movements of the two men since instead of entering the cabin they had stopped in front of it where they at once became engaged in conversation i took it for granted that i was myself the subject but after a time i began to fancy i was mistaken judging from the earnest manner of both but more especially from holt's gestures and frequent ejaculations something of still greater interest appeared to be the theme of their dialogue i saw the squatter's face suddenly brighten up as if some new and joyous revelation had been made to him while the features of his visitor bore the satisfied look of one who was urging an argument with success they were evidently talking of some topic beyond my affair and unconnected with it but what could it be i was unable even to guess 
perhaps had i listened more attentively i might have arrived at some knowledge of it since words were occasionally uttered aloud but my eyes were busier than my ears and at that moment neither the squatter nor his guest was the subject of my thoughts beyond them was the attraction that fascinated my gaze that thing of roseate golden hue whose shining presence seemed to light up the dark interior of the cabin gleaming meteor-like through the interstices of the logs now softly moving from side to side oh now thank heaven gliding towards the door only for a moment stood she silently on the stoop one smiling moment and she was gone her fair face was once more hidden behind the rude jalousie of the logs but the smile remained it was mine and lingered long within the trembling temple of my heart End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter twenty seven yes yes towards the interior of the hut hallowed by such lovely presence i continued to direct my glances with an occasional side look noting the movements of the two men whatever had been the exciting topic of discourse but the moment before i saw that it was now changed and that i was myself the subject of their conversation this i could tell by their looks and gestures evidently bearing upon me and my business conscious that i was observing them and as if desirous of conferring more privately they passed round to the rear of the cabin where for the time they were out of my sight as well as hearing so far from regretting this movement it was just what i desired it left me free to continue the pleasant espionage in which i had become engaged new more boldly my eyes explored the dark interior of the hut more freely roamed my glance along the interstices of the logs gladly should i have gone up to the doorway fain would i have been to enter had i not been restrained but delicacy and something more stood in the way and i was forced to keep my ground again i saw the bright form flitting within gliding gently across the floor as if on tiptoe and by stealth the young girl stood for a while near the back wall of the cabin close behind this the two men were conversing did she go there to listen she might easily hear what was said i could myself distinguish the voices and almost the words she remained motionless and as well as i could judge in an attitude of attention her head lowered and her body bent slightly forward i was forming conjectures as to her motive when i saw her moving away from the spot in another instant she appeared in the doorway this time evidently with some design as her manner clearly betokened for a moment she stood upon the stoop fronting towards me but with her face averted and her eyes by a side glance directed towards the rear of the hut she appeared to look and listen as if noting the position of the men and then seemingly satisfied that she was not herself observed she suddenly faced round and came running towards me taken by surprise a surprise mingled with sweet satisfaction i rose to my feet and stood silently but respectfully awaiting her approach i had acted with prudence in not speaking for i saw by her manner that the movement was a stolen one moreover the finger raised for an instant to her lips admonished me to silence i understood the signal so piquantly given and obeyed it 
in another instant she was near near enough for me to hear her words delivered in a half whisper she had paused before me in an attitude that betokened the fear of interruption and before speaking again cast behind her another of those unquiet looks brave stranger said she in a hurried undertone i know you are not afraid of my father but oh sir for mercy's sake do not fight with him for your sake i said interrupting her and speaking in a low but impressive tone for your sake fair lillian i shall not fight with him trust me there is no fear i shall bear anything rather than hush said she again motioning me to silence at the same time glancing furtively behind her you must not speak you may be heard only listen to me i know why you are here i came out to tell you something i listen father does not wish to quarrel with you he has changed his mind i have just heard what they said he intends to make you a proposal oh sir if you can please agree to it for then there will be no trouble i hope there will be none for you fair lillian i shall agree to it whatever the conditions be can you tell me what proposal he intends making me i heard him say he would sell oh mercy they are coming if i am seen the murmuring words were drowned by the louder voices of the men who were now heard returning round the angle of the wall fortunately before they had reached the front of the cabin the young girl had glided back into the doorway and no suspicion appeared to be entertained by either of the clandestine visit just paid me on rounding the corner the stranger stopped the squatter continued to advance until within a few paces of where i stood then halting he erected his gigantic form to its full height and for a moment confronted me without speaking i noticed that his countenance no longer bore signs of angry passion but on the contrary betrayed some traces of a softer feeling as of regret and contrition stringer said he at length i've two things to propose to ye and if ye'll agree to them there's no need why you and i shed quarrel least of all plug one another we bullets as we were a gwine to do a minute ago name your conditions rejoined i and if they are not impossible for me to accept i promise you they shall be agreed to with lillian in my thoughts they would be hard indeed if i could not square with whatever terms he might propose they ain't impossible neither of em. they're only just and fair let me hear them and believe me hickman holt i shall judge them most liberally fust then you called me a coward do you take that back willingly i do so for good and now for t'other proposal i have to make i don't acknowledge your right to this clarin i've made it and called it my own as a sovereign citizen of these united states and i don't care a cuss for preemption right since i don't believe in any man's right to move me off o the ground i clared but i ain't so darn particular about this sharp bit another'll answer my business equally as well maybe better and if you'll pay me for my improvements ye can take both clarin and cabin and have no more muss about it them's my proposals how much do you expect for these improvements at what sum do you value them i trembled as i awaited the answer my poor purse felt light as it lay against my bosom far lighter than the heart within though that had been heavier but an hour before i knew that the sack contained less than two hundred dollars in notes of the planter's bank 
and i feared that such a sum would never satisfy the expectations of the squatter wall stranger replied he after a pause a worth a good ween o' dollars but i shan't valley em myself i'll leave that part of my business to a third individual my friend as stands thou and who's a just man and's been some at o a lawyer too you say what's fair atween us won't you josh i thought this rather a familiar style of address on the part of the squatter towards his clerical and saint-like friend but i refrained from showing my astonishment oh yes replied the other i'll value the property with pleasure that is if the gentleman desires me to do so how much do you think it worth i inquired with nervous anxiety well i should say that for the improvements mr holt has made a hundred dollars would be a fair compensation a hundred dollars yes in cash of course i mean will you be satisfied with that sum said i turning to holt for the answer perfectly satisfied so long as it's in cash i agreed to give it then all right stranger a bargain's a bargain you can shell out the dollars and i'll gie ye possession afore this gentleman who'll witness it in writing ef you like i want no writing i can trust to your word it was no flattery i felt at the moment that the squatter rudely as he had acted was still possessed of an honourable principle and i knew that under the circumstances his word would not only be as good as his bond but better i made no hesitation therefore but counting out the money placed it upon the stump alongside that curious document impaled there by the blade of the squatter's knife when would ye like to take possession asked the outgoing tenant at your convenience i replied wishing to behave as courteously as possible it won't take me long to move my furniture ain't very cumbersome and i could let ye in tomorrow if twasn't that i have some unexpected business with my friend here say day arter the morrow if you'll come then you'll find me ready to deliver up will that answer for ye admirably was my reply all right then i'll ask ye in but thar's nothing to gie ye exceptin that piece of deer meat and it's raw besides stringer i've some particular business jest now that i'm bleeged to see to oh never mind i shall not need any refreshment till i reach swampville well then i'll bid you good mornin at the same time wishin you luck o oh, your bargain thanks good morning i leaped into the saddle and turned my horse's head toward the entrance of the enclosure i should have given him the touch to go forward with more reluctance for i had not perceived the fair lillian gliding out of the cabin and proceeding in the same direction two or three of the bars had been replaced by the clerical visitor and she had gone apparently to remove them was it simply courtesy or a pretense to speak with me my heart heaved with a tumultuous joy as i fancied that the latter might be her motive when i reached the entrance the bars were down and the young girl stood leaning against one of the uprights her round white arm embracing the post envied piece of timber promise me we shall meet again said i bending down and speaking in a half whisper she looked back towards the cabin with a timid glance we were not observed the two men had gone into the horse shed in her fingers i noticed the flower of a begonia she had taken it from among the golden tresses of her hair her cheek rivalled the crimson of its corolla as she flung the blossom upon the saddle-bow promise me 
i repeated in a more earnest tone yes yes she replied in a soft low voice that resembled the whisper of an angel and then hearing noises from the house she passed hurriedly away yes yes cried the mimic thrush as i rode on through the tall tulip trees yes yes repeated a thousand rival songsters or were the sounds i heard but the echoes of her voice still pealing through the glad chambers of my heart End of chapter 27 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 28 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed Chapter 28 An Errand of Love this second purchase and payment rendered necessary a communication with my nashville friend fortunately swampville had a mail and to avail myself of it i rode direct for the settlement on my return i found the river town figuratively speaking on fire short as bad been the period of my absence it had been marked by an incident of no ordinary character that morning's mail had conveyed to the settlement the intelligence of a rare and interesting event the discovery of the gold placers of california i had heard rumors of this before only half believed and not yet reaching to swampville returned emigrants from california were now reported as having arrived in st louis and other frontier towns bringing with them not only the full account of the gold discovery but its confirmation in the shape of large chunks of gold-bearing quartz and bags of the yellow dust itself the marvellous tale was no longer questioned or doubted the mail had brought newspapers from new orleans and st louis giving detailed accounts of the digging of sutter's mill race by the disbanded soldiers of the mormon battalion of the crevasse caused by the water which had laid open the wonderful auriferous deposits and describing also the half-frantic excitement which the news had produced these populous cities in this swampville had not been slow to imitate them i found the little village on the qui vive not only the idlers showing an interest in the extraordinary intelligence but the business men of the place being equally startled out of their sobriety a company was already projected in which many well-to-do men had registered their names and even colonel kipp talked of transporting his penates across the great plains and swinging the jackson sign upon the shores of the pacific swampville was smitten with a golden mania that seemed to promise its speedy depopulation though many of my old camarados of the mexican campaign found fresh vent for their energies in this new field of enterprise for me it had no attractions whatever i therefore resisted the solicitations of the swampvillians to join their company in which i was offered the compliment of a command on that day and at that hour not for all the gold in california would i have forsaken my new home in the forest under whose boundless continuity of shade sparkled in my eyes a metal more attractive instead of longing for the far shores of the pacific I longed only to return to the banks of Mud Creek and chafe at the necessary delay that hindered me from gratifying my wish. Even the generous hospitality of Colonel Kipp, amiable under the influence of golden dreams, even the smiles of the simpering Alvina and the more brave coquetry of Carline, now become a decided admirer of my yellow buttons were not sufficient to preserve my spirits from ennui only at meals did i make my appearance at the hotel at all other times seeking to soothe the impassioned pulsations of my heart in the dark depths of the forest there i would wander for hours not listing where i went but ever finding myself as if by some instinct upon the path that conducted in the direction of the creek 
it was some solace to listen to the notes of the wild woods the songs of birds and bee for these had become associated in my mind with the melodious tones of lillian's voice to look upon the forest flowers more especially upon the encarmined blossom of the begonia now to me a symbol of the sweetest sentiment the one most prized of all i had carefully preserved in a glass i had placed it on the dressing-table of my chamber with its peduncle immersed in water my zealous care only procured me a chagrin on returning from one of my rambles i found the flower upon the floor crushed by some spiteful heel was it thy heel caroline kipp in its place was a bunch of hideous gilly flowers and yellow daffodils of the dimensions of a drumhead cabbage placed there either to mock my regard or elicit my admiration in either case i resolved upon revanche by its wound the begonia smelt sweeter than ever and though i could not restore the pretty blossom to its graceful campanulate shape from that time forward it appeared in my buttonhole to the slight torture i fancied of the backwoods coquette in the two days during which i was denied sight of her my love for lillian holt was fast ripening into a passion which absence only seemed to amplify. No doubt the contrast of common faces, such as those I observed in Swampville, did something towards heightening my admiration. There was another contrast that had at this time an influence on my heart's inclinings. To an eye, fatigued with dwelling long and continuously on the dark complexions of the South, the olivine hue of aztec and iberian skins there was a relief in the radiance of this carmined blonde that apart from her absolute loveliness was piquant from the novelty and rareness of the characteristic additional elements of attraction may have been the mise en scene that surrounded her the unexpected discovery of such a precious jewel in so rude a casket the romantic incident of our first encounter and the equally peculiar circumstances attending our second and last interview all these may have combined in weaving around my spirit a spell that now embraced and was likely to influence every act of my future existence therefore on the morning of the third day as i mounted my horse and turned his head in the direction of holt's clearing it was not with any design of dispossessing the squatter occupied with sweet love dreams i had as yet given no thought to the ruder realities of life i had formed no plan for colonizing nor towards entering upon possession nor extending the improvement i had twice purchased notwithstanding both purchase and payment the squatter might still continue to hold his cabin and clearing and share with me the disputed land welcome should i make him on one condition the condition of becoming his guest constant or occasional in either way so long as i might have the opportunity of enjoying the presence of his fair daughter and to her demonstrating my heart's devotion some such idea vaguely conceived flitted across my mind as i entered upon my second journey to mud creek my ostensible object was to take formal possession of an estate and turn out its original owner but my heart was in no unison with such an end it recoiled from or rather had it forgotten its purpose its throbbings were directed to a different object guiding me on a more joyful and auspicious errand the errand of love end of chapter twenty eight recording by john brandon chapter twenty nine of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by John Brandon. 
the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter twenty nine a redskin sibyl not a sound came from the forest to disturb my sweet musings silent was the sky of the indian summer soft and balm laden its breeze the trees stirred not the branches seemed extended in the stillness of repose even the leaves of the tremuloids hanging on their compressed petioles were scarcely seen to quiver the rustling heard at intervals was but the fluttering of bright wings amid the foliage or the rushing of some mountbank squirrel in reckless evolution among the branches sounds harmonizing with the scene not till i had entered the glade was i aroused from my reverie at first gently by the sudden emergence from shade into light but afterwards in a more sensible manner on sight of a human form at a glance recognized as that of the indian maiden she was seated or rather reclining against the blanched log her brown arm embracing an outstretched limb half supported on one leg the other crossed carelessly over it in an attitude of repose beside her on the log lay a wicker pannier filled with odds and ends of indian manufacture though i had risen close up to the girl she vouchsafed no acknowledgment of my presence i observed no motion not even of the eyes which directed downwards seemed fixed in steadfast gaze upon the ground nothing about her appeared to move save the coruscation of metallic ornaments that glittered in the sun as though her body were enveloped in scale armour otherwise she might have been mistaken for a statue in bronze and one too of noble proportions the attitude was in every way graceful and displayed to perfection the full bold contour of the maiden's form her well-rounded arm entwining the branch with her large body and limbs outlined in alto relievo against the entablature of the white trunk presented a picture that a sculptor would have loved to copy and that even the inartistic eye could not look upon without admiration instinctively i checked my horse and halted in front of this singular apparition i could scarcely tell why i did so since neither by look nor gesture was i invited to take such a liberty on the contrary i could perceive that my movement was regarded with displeasure there was no change in the statuesque attitude even the eyes were not raised from the earth but a frown was distinctly traceable on the features of the girl thus repulsed i should have ridden on and would have done so but for the sense of awkwardness which one feels in similar situations by pausing in the marked manner i had done and gazing so pointedly at the girl i had committed an act of ill-breeding of which i now felt sensible indian though she was she was evidently no common squaw but gifted with certain noble traits of which many a maiden with white skin might have envied her the possession beyond that i knew she was the victim of a passion all absorbing as it was hopeless and this in my eyes ennobled and sanctified her just then i had myself no cause to fear an unrequited love no need to be ungenerous or selfish and could therefore afford to extend my sympathy to the sufferings of another it was some vague prompting of this kind that had caused me to draw up some idea of offering consolation the repelling reception was altogether unexpected and placed me in a predicament how was i to escape from it by holding my tongue and riding on no this would be an acknowledgment of having committed an act of gauchery to which man's vanity rarely exceeds or only with extreme reluctance i had rushed inconsiderably into the mire and must plunge deeper to get through we must become worse to make our title good so reflecting or rather without reflecting at all i resolved to become worse with the risk of making a worse of it perhaps thought i she does not recognize me she had not looked at me as yet if she would only raise her eyes she would remember me as the friend of the white eagle that might initiate a conversation 
and cause her to interpret more kindly my apparent rudeness i shall speak to her at all hazards suwanee the dark indian eye was raised upon me with an angry flash but no other reply was vouchsafed suwanee i repeated in the most conciliatory tone do you not remember me i am the friend of the white eagle and what is that to suwanee she has no words for you you may go on this decided repulse instead of bettering my position rendered it still more complicated somewhat confusedly i rejoined i am on the way to visit white eagle i thought perhaps you might that possibly you might have some message for him suwanee has no message for the white eagle replied she interrupting me in the indignant tone and with a contemptuous toss of her head if she had she would not choose a false pale face like himself to be its bearer you fancy white man you can insult the indian maiden at your pleasure you dare not take such liberty with one of your own color i assure you i had no such intention my object was very different i was prompted to speak to you knowing something of your affair of the other night with my friend wingrove which you remember i was witness of i could not help overhearing i was interrupted by another quick contemptuous exclamation that accompanied a glance of mingled vexation and scorn you may know too much and too little my brave slayer of red panthers suwanee does not thank you for interfering in her affairs she can promise you sufficient occupation with your own go see to them how what mean you i hurriedly asked perceiving a certain significance in her looks as well as words that produced within me a sudden feeling of inquietude what mean you i repeated too anxious to wait her reply has anything happened go see yourself you lose time in talking to a squaw as you call us haste or your bell-flower will be plucked and crushed like that which you wear so proudly upon your breast the wolf has slept in the lair of the forest deer the yellow fawn will be his victim suwanee joys at it ha 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 hers will not be the only heart wrung by the villainy of the false pale-face ha 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 go brave slayer of red panthers ah you may go but only to grieve you will be too late too late too late finishing her speech with another peal of half maniac laughter she snatched her pannier from the log flung it over her shoulder and hurried away from the spot her words though ill understood were full of fearful significance and acted upon me like a shock for a moment paralyzing my powers both of speech and action in my anxiety to ascertain their full meaning i would have intercepted her retreat but before i could recover from my unpleasant surprise she had glided in among the shrubbery and disappeared from my sight End of chapter 29 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 30 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by John Brandon The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed Chapter 30 a storm without and within heading my horse to the path i rode out of the glade but with very different feelings from those i had on entering it the words of this ill-starred maiden attained with that sibylline cunning peculiar to her race had filled my heart with most dire forebodings her speech could not be mere conjecture put forth to vex and annoy me she had scarcely motive enough for this besides her display of a positive foreknowledge was proof against the supposition that she was deceiving me slayer of red panthers 
you may go but only to grieve your bellflower will be plucked and crushed like that you wear so proudly upon your breast these and other like innuendos could not be conjectural however obtained they betokened a knowledge of the past with an implied forecast of the future probable as it was painful the yellow fawn too the reference was clear lillian holt was the yellow fawn but the wolf that had slept in its lair who was the wolf who was to make her a victim and how these unpleasant interrogatives passed rapidly through my mind and without obtaining reply i was unable to answer them even by conjecture enough that there was a wolf and that lillian holt was in danger of becoming his victim this brought me to the consideration of the last words still ringing in my ears you will be too late too late prompted by their implied meaning i drove the spurs into my horse and galloped forward as fast as the nature of the ground would permit my mind was in dread confusion a chaos of doubt and fear the half-knowledge i had obtained was more painful to endure than a misfortune well ascertained for i suffered the associated agonies of suspense and darkly outlined suspicion a wolf in what shape and guise a victim how and by what means what the nature of the predicted danger the elements seemed in unison with my spirit as if they too had taken their cue from the ill-omened bodings of my indian oracle a storm cloud had suddenly obscured the sun black as the wing of the buzzard vulture red shafts were shooting athwart the sky threatening to scathe the trees of the forest thunder rolled continuously along their tops and huge isolated raindrops like gouts of blood came pattering down upon the leaves soon to fall thick and continuous i heeded not these indications at that moment what were the elements to me what cared i for the clouds or rain lightning thunder or the riven forest there was a cloud on my own heart an electric rush through my veins of far more potent spell than the shadows of the sky or the coruscations of the ethereal fire the wolf has slept in the lair of the forest deer the yellow fawn will be his victim you will be too late too late these were clouds to be regarded the fires to be feared no heavenly light to guide me along the path but a flame infernal burning in my breast the bars were down but it mattered not i would have leaped the fence had there been no gateway but the entrance to the enclosure was free and galloping through it i drew bridle in front of the hut the door was open wide open as was its wont and i could see most of the interior no one appeared within no one came forth to greet me inside i observed some pieces of rude furniture several chairs and a rough table i had noticed them on my first visit they were now in the same place just as i had seen them before one of my apprehensions was allayed by the sight the family was still there strange that no one hears me that no one comes out to receive me i made these reflections after having waited a considerable while surely i was expected it was the time named by holt himself the day and hour was i again unwelcome and had the squatter relapsed into his uncourteous mood it certainly had that appearance more especially since it was raining at the moment as if the very clouds were coming down and i stood in need of shelter but that grievance was little thought of i was suffering a chagrin far more intolerable than the tempest where was lillian such cool reception on her part i had not expected it was indeed a surprise had i mistaken the character of this idyllian damsel was she too an arch-creature a coquette 
had she bestowed the blossom only to betray me i had looked down at the crushed corolla borne upon my breast i had promised myself a triumph by its presence there i had formed pleasant anticipations of its being recognized fond hopes of its creating an effect in my favour the flower looked drenched and draggled its carmine colour had turned to a dull dark crimson it was the colour of blood i could bear the suspense no longer i would have hailed the house but by this time i had become convinced that there was no one inside after a short survey i had remarked a change in the appearance of the cabin the interstices between the logs where they had formerly been covered with skins were now open the draping had been removed and a closer scrutiny enabled me to perceive that so far as human occupants were concerned the house was empty i rode up to the door and leaning over from my saddle looked in my conjecture was correct only the chairs and table with one or two similar pieces of plenishing remained everything else had been removed and some worthless debris strewed over the floor told that the removal was to be considered complete they were gone it was of no use harboring a hope that they might still be on the premises outside or elsewhere near the pouring rain forbade a supposition there was nowhere else the horse shed excepted where they could have sheltered themselves from its torrent and they were not in the shed rosinante was absent from his rude stall saddle and bridle had alike disappeared i needed no further assurance they were gone with a heavy heart i slid out of my saddle led my steed under the shed and then entered the deserted dwelling my footfall upon the plank floor sounded heavy and harsh as i strode over it making a survey of the premises my future home i might have observed with ludicrous surprise the queer character of the building and how sadly it needed repair but i was in no mood to be merry either with the house or its furniture and tottering into one of the odd-looking chairs i gave way to gloomy reflections any one seeing me at that moment would have observed me in an attitude more benefiting a man about to be turned out of his estate than one just entering upon possession end of chapter thirty recording by john brandon chapter thirty one of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter thirty one a virgin heart in cipher gone and whither gone half aloud i soliloquized the interrogatory there was an echo from empty walls but no reply even conjecture failed to furnish an answer the affair was altogether unexpected not anticipating that the squatter would leave his cabin before my return i had made no inquiry either about his destination or future designs i was therefore without the slightest clue as to whither he had gone nor should i have had any inquietude at this premature disappearance but for the words of the indian sibyl beyond the mere disappointment of missing an interview with lillian chagrin enough after such high raised expectation i should not have felt either uneasiness or regret it would have been but natural to believe that they had moved to some neighbor's house perhaps to that up the creek where lived the friend of lillian's father in all likelihood the saint i had seen or some other within a five-mile circuit or if even ten miles distant what would it matter to me a ride of ten miles twice a day would be nothing only an airing for my arab i should soon scent out the whereabouts of that sweet-smelling rose not all the forests in tennessee could hide from me my fair blooming flower such would have been my reflections no doubt had i not encountered the indian girl but her words of harsh warning now guided the current of my thoughts into a ruder channel you may go but only to grieve you will be too late figurative as was her speech and undefined its meaning 
it produced within me a presentiment sufficiently real that the removal was not a mere flit to some temporary shelter under a neighbor's roof but a departure for a distant point scarcely a presentiment but a belief a conviction around me were circumstances corroborative of this view the articles of furniture left behind though rude were still of a certain value especially to a householder of holt's condition and had the squatter designed to re-erect his roof-tree in the neighbourhood he would no doubt have taken them with him otherwise they were too heavy for a distant migration perhaps he intended to return for them if so but no there was no probability of his doing so i need not have tried to comfort myself with the reflection the innuendos of the indian had already negatived the hope still vaguely indulging in it however i cast a glance around the room in search of some object that might guide my conjectures to a more definite conclusion while so employed my eyes fell upon a piece of paper carelessly folded it lay upon the rough table the only object there with the exception of some crumbs of cornbread and the debris of a tobacco pipe i recognized the piece of paper it was an old acquaintance the leaf from my memorandum book upon which was written the laconic last will and testament jointly signed by the squatter and myself on observing this paper upon the table it did not occur to me that it had been left there with any design my reflection was that the squatter had taken it from the stump and carried it into the house perhaps to show it to his clerical visitor no doubt they had enjoyed a good laugh over it as the souvenir of a ludicrous incident and for this very reason i resolved upon preserving it i had taken the document in my hand and was about depositing it in my pocket-book when my eye was attracted by some fresh writing on the paper a slight scrutiny of the recent cipher secured for the torn leaf a deeper interest than i had before felt in it i saw that it was the chirography of a female hand what other than the hand of lillian i thought of no other beyond doubt her fingers had guided the pencil for it was pencil writing and guided it so deftly as to impress me with surprise and admiration astonished was i that she the child of a rude squatter should be able to set down her ideas in so fair a hand thoughts thrilling though simply expressed ah sweet simple words trembled my own hand as i read them trembled as from a spell of delirium a delirium produced by the antagonistic emotions of grief and joy yes both were present in that simple inscript i had found cue for both for there i learnt the ecstatic truth that i was beloved and along with it the bitter intelligence that my love was lost to me for ever words of welcome and words of woe how could they be thus commingled read them and learn to edward warfield stranger it is to say farewell but i am very sad as i write these words when you asked me to promise to meet you again i was happy i said yes oh sir it can never be we are going to some far place and shall be gone before you come here and i shall never see you again it is very distant and i do not know the name of the country for it is not in tennessee nor in the united states but somewhere in the west a long way beyond the mississippi river and the great prairies but it is a country where they dig gold out of the sand perhaps you have heard of it and might know it i tried to know its name but father is angry with me for speaking of you and will not tell me and our friend that you saw who is taking us with him will not tell me either but i shall find out soon and if i thought you might like to know where we are gone i would write to you i am glad that mother taught me to write though i do not compose very well but if you will allow me i will send a letter to swampville from the first place we come to to tell you the name of the country where we are going i know your name for it is upon this paper and i hope you will not think i have done wrong for i have written my own name beside it oh sir i am very sad that i am not to see you any more for i am afraid father will never come back i could cry all night and all day and i have cried a deal but i am afraid of their seeing me for both father and his friend have scolded me and said many things against you i do not like to hear them say things against you and for that reason i try not to let them know how very sorry i am that i am never to meet you any more brave stranger you saved my life but it is not that i think that makes me so unhappy now but something else you are so different from the others i have seen and what you said to me was not like anything i ever heard before your words sounded so sweet and i could have listened to them forever i remember every one of them and then i was so proud when you took the flower from me and held it to your lips for it made me think that you would be my friend i have been very lonely since my sister marion went away she went with the man you saw i hope 
to see her soon now as she is somewhere out in the country where we are going to but that will not make me happy if i can never see you again oh sir forgive me for writing all that i have written but i thought from what you said to me you would not be displeased with me for it and that is why i have written it but i must write no more for my eyes are full of tears and i cannot see the paper i hope you will not burn it but keep it to remember lillian holt yes lillian to the last hour of my life close to my bosom shall it lie that simple souvenir of your maiden love sacred page transcript of sweet truth hollowed by the first offerings of a virgin heart over and over and over again i read the cipher to me more touching than the wildest tale of romance alas it was not all joy there was more than a moiety of sadness constantly increasing its measure in another moment the sadness overcame the joy i tottered towards the chair and dropped into it my spirit completely prostrated by the conflicting emotions End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter thirty two a word about mormon monsters not long did i remain under the mental paralysis there was no time for idle repining the intelligence derived from the torn leaf had given me a cue for action and my spirit struggled to free itself from the lethargy of grief hope whispered the watchword up and be doing and i arose to obey its mandate my heart was on fire wildly madly on fire the contents of that epistle while it imbued my spirit with the sweetest of all earthly pleasures revealed to it the deadliest of dangers imparting to it an anguish beyond expression it told me far more than the writer herself knew both of her love and what she had need to fear for in her guileless innocence was she alike unconscious of the passion and the peril not so i she had opened her heart before me as on a printed page i could trace its tender inclinings had this been all i should have been happy supremely happy but alas that writing told me more that she who had penciled it was in deadly peril no not deadly it was not of life but of something far dearer to me a thousand times more dear her virgin honour now comprehended i in all their diabolical significance those wild weird words the wolf has slept in the lair of the forest deer the yellow fun will be his victim now knew i the wolf a wolf disguised in the clothing of the lamb it needed no remarkable acumen to tell me whom the figure referred the writings itself revealed him all but the name and that was manifest by implication the man with whom marian went away he whom i had seen in clerical garb and guise was the wolf of the metaphor and that man was stebbins the mormon with him too lillian had gone away not with words can i express the suggestive hideousness of this thought to understand it in all its cruel significance the reader should be acquainted with that peculiar sect known as the church of latter-day saints should have read its history and its chronicles without this knowledge he will be ill able to comprehend the peculiar bitterness that in that hour wrapped and wrung my soul accident had made me acquainted with the mormon religion not with its tenets for it has none but with the moral idiosyncrasy of its most eminent apostles as well as that of its humbler devotees two very different classes of saints in the animal world we seek in vain for the type of either class the analogies of wolf and lamb hawk and pigeon cat and mouse cannot be employed with any degree of appropriateness not one of them in all these creatures there are traits either of nobility or beauty neither is to be found in the life and character of a mormon whether he be a sincere neophyte or a hypocritical apostle perhaps the nearest antagonistic forms of the animal world by which we might typify the antithetic conditions of mormon life both social and religious are those of fox and goose though no doubt the subtle reynard would scorn the comparison nor indeed is the fox a true type for even about him there are redeeming qualities something to relieve the soul from that loathing which it feels in contemplating the character of a ruling elder among the saints it would be difficult to imagine anything further removed from what we may term the divinity of human nature than one of these vulgar and brutal cunning and cruel are ordinary epithets and altogether too weak to characterize such a creature 
some of the twelves and of the seventies may lack one or other of these characteristics in most cases however you may safely bestow them all and if it be the chief of the sect the president himself you may add such other ugly pellitives as your fancy may suggest and be sure that your portraiture will still fall short of the hideousness of the original perhaps the most striking characteristic of these fanatics is the absolute openness of their cheat a more commonplace imposture has never been offered for acceptance even to the most ignorant of mankind it appeals neither to reason nor romance the one is insulted by the very shallowness of its chicanery while its rank plebishness disgusts the other even the nomenclature both of its offices and office bearers has a vulgar ring that smacks of ignoble origin the names twelves seventies deacons wifedom smiths hiram and joseph pratt snow young cowdery and the like coupled as they are with affectation and imitation of scripture phraseology form a vocabulary burlesquing even the sacred book itself and suggesting by their sounds the true character of the mormon church a very essence of plebeian hypocrisy i have used the words fanatics but that must be understood in a limited sense it can only be applied to the geese the ignorant and besotted canile which the apostolic emissaries have collected from all parts of europe but chiefly from england scotland and wales the welsh as might be expected furnish a large proportion of these emigrant geese while strange as it may sound there is but one irish goose in the whole mormon flock there are but few of these birds of native american breed the general intelligence supplied by a proper school system prevents much proselytism in that quarter but it does not hinder the acute yankee from playing the part of the fox for in reality this is his role in the social system of mormondom the president or high priest and prophet himself the twelves and seventies the elders deacons and other dignitaries are all or nearly all of true yankee growth and to call these fanatics would be a misapplication of the word term them conspirators charlatans hypocrites and impostors if you will but not fanatics the mormon fox is no fanatic he is a professor in the most emphatic sense of the word but not a believer his profession is absolute chicanery he has neither faith dogma nor doctrine there are writers who have defended these forbans of religion and some who have even spoken well of their system captain stansbury the explorer has a good opinion of them the captain is at best but a superficial observer and unfortunately for his judgment received most courteous treatment at their hands it is not human nature to speak ill of the bridge that has carried one over and captain stansbury has obeyed the common impulse in the earlier times of the mormon church there were champions of the stansbury school to defend its members against the charge of polygamy in those days the saints themselves attempted a sort of denial of it the subject was then too rank to come forth as a revelation but a truth of this awkward kind could not long remain untold and it became necessary to mask it under the more moderate title of a spiritual wifedom it required an acute metaphysician to comprehend this spiritual relationship and the moralist was puzzled to understand its sanctity during that period while the saints dwelt within the pale of the gentiles country this cloak was kept on but after their exodus to the salt lake settlements the flimsy garment was thrown off being found too inconvenient to be worn any longer there the motive for concealment was removed and the apology of a spiritual wifedom ceased to exist it came out in its carnal and sensual shape polygamy was boldly preached and proclaimed as it had ever been practised in its most hideous shape and the defenders of mormon purity thus betrayed by their pet protégés dropped their broken lances to the ground the institution is even more odious under mormon than mohammed there is no redeeming point not even the romance of the harem for the zenana of a latter-day saint is a type of the most vulgar materialism or even the favorite sultana is not exempted from the hard workaday duties of a slave polygamy no the word has too limited a signification to characterize the condition of a mormon wife we must resort to the phraseology of the banil in company of a mormon had lillian gone away no wonder that my heart was on fire wildly madly on fire i rose from my seat and rushed forth for my horse the storm still raged apace clouds and rolling thunder lightning and rain rain such as that which ushered in the deluge the storm what cared i for its fury rain antediluvian would not have stayed me indoors not if it had threatened the drowning of the world
End of chapter 32、Chapter、33 Into my saddle, off out of the clearing, away through the dripping forest, on through the sweltering swamp, I hurried. Up the creek was my route, my destination, the dwelling of the hunter Wingrove. Surely in such weather I should find him at home. It was natural I should seek the young backwoodsman. In such an emergency I might count with certainty on having his advice and assistance. True, I anticipated no great benefit from either, for what could either avail me? The young man was helpless as myself. And had similarly suffered. This would secure me his sympathy, but what more could he give? After all, I did not reckon it as nothing. The condolence of a friend or fellow sufferer may soothe, though it cannot cure, and for such a solace the heart intuitively seeks. Confidence and sympathy are consolatory virtues. Even penance has its purpose. I longed, therefore, for a friend, one to whom I could confide my secret and unbosom my sorrow, and I sought that friend in the young backwoodsman. I had a claim upon him. He had made me the confidant of his care, the recipient of his heart confessed. Little dreamed I at the time I should be so soon calling upon him for a reciprocity of the kindness. Fortune so far favoured me. I found him at home. My arrival scarcely roused him from a dejection that I could perceive was habitual to him. I knew its cause and could see that he was struggling against it, lest it should hinder him from the fulfilment of his duties as a host. It did not. There was something truly noble in this conquest of courtesy over the heart heavily laden, charged and engrossed with selfish care. Not without admiration did I observe the conflict. I hesitated not to confide my secret to such a man. I felt convinced that under the buckskin coat beat the heart of a gentleman. I told him the whole story of my love, beginning with the hour in which I had left him. The tale aroused him from his apathy, more especially the episode which related to my first meeting with Lillian. And the encounter that followed, as a hunter, this last would have secured his attention, but it was not altogether that. The scene touched a chord in unison with his own memories, for by some such incident he had first won the favor of Marian. As I approached the finale of the duel scene, that point where the stranger had appeared on the stage, I could perceive the interest of my listener culminating to a pitch of excitement, and before I had pronounced ten words in description of the clerical visitor, the young hunter sprang to his feet. Exclaiming as he did so, "Josh Stebbins!" Yes, it was he. I know it myself. I continued the narrative, but I saw I was no longer listened to with attention. Wingrove was on his feet and pacing the floor with nervous, irregular strides. Every now and then I saw him glance towards his rifle that rested above the fireplace, while the angry flash of his eyes betokened that he was meditating some serious design. As soon as I had described the winding up of the duel. And what followed, including my departure from Swampville, I was again interrupted by the young hunter. This time, not by his speech, but by an action equally significant. Hastily approaching the fireplace, he lifted his rifle from the cleats, and dropping the piece upon its butt, commenced loading it. It was not the movement itself so much as the time and manner that arrested my attention, and these declared the object of the act. Neither for squirrel nor coon, deer, bear nor panther, was that rifle being loaded. Where are you going? I inquired, seeing that he had taken down his coonskin cap and slung on his pouch and powder horn. Only a bit down a crick. You'll excuse me, stranger, for leaving o' you, but I'll be back in the twinkling of an eye. There's a bit o' dinner for you if you can eat cold deer meat, and you'll find something in the old bottle there. It won't be gone more than an hour. I reckon I won't. The emphasis expressed a certain indecision, which I observed without being able to interpret. I had my conjectures, however. Can I not go with you? I asked in hopes of drawing him to declare his design. The weather is cleared up, and I should prefer riding out to staying here alone, if it's not some business of a private nature. You're nothing particularly private about it, stranger, but it's a business I don't want you to be mixed up in. I guess you've got your own troubles now, without taking share of mine. If it's not rude, may I ask the business on which you're going? Welcome to know it, stranger. I'm a going to kill Josh Stebbins. Kill Josh Stebbins? Either that or he shall kill me. Oh, nonsense! 
I exclaimed, surprised less at the intention, which I had already half divined, than at the cool determined tone in which it was declared. I've said it, stranger. I've sworn it over and over, and it shall be done. Tain't no new notion I've took. I determined on making him fight long ago, for I'd an old score to sell with him, afore that you know a but I never kid got that skunk to stand up. He allers took care to keep out of my way. Now I've made up my mind, and he don't dodge me any longer. And by the eternal, if that black-hearted snake's to be found in a settlement, he is not to be found in the settlement. Not to be found in a settlement, echoed the hunter, in a tone that betrayed both surprise and vexation. Not to be found in a settlement. Surely you ain't an earnest stranger. You seed him to-day afore yesterday. True, but I have reason to think he is gone. God forbid, but you ain't sure o' it. What makes you think he air gone? Too sure of it. It was that knowledge that brought me in such haste to your cabin. I detailed the events of the morning which Wingrove had not yet heard. My brief interview with the Indian maiden, her figurative prophecy that had proved but too truthful. I described the deserted dwelling, and at last read to him the letter of Lillian. Read it from beginning to end. He listened with attention, though chafing at the delay. Once or twice only did he interrupt me with the simple expression, "'Poor little Lil! Poor little Lil!' repeated he when he had finished. "'She too gone with him, just as Marion went six months ago.' "'No, no!' he exclaimed, correcting himself in a voice that proclaimed the agony of his thoughts. "'No, it war different. Altogether different. Marion went willingly.' "'How know you that?' I said, with a half-conceived hope of consoling him know it oh stranger i'm sure it suwanee said so that signifies nothing it is not the truer of her having said so a jealous and spiteful rival perhaps the very contrary is the truth perhaps marian was forced to marry this man her father may have influenced her and it is not at all unlikely since he appears to be himself under some singular influence as if in dread of his saintly son-in-law I noticed some circumstances that would lead one to this conclusion. Thank you, stranger, for them words, cried the young hunter, rushing forward, and grasping me eagerly by the hand. It's the first bit of comfort I've had since Marian were took away. I've heard myself that Holt were a fear to Stebbins, and maybe that sneak in the grass had a call about him somehow. I confess you, it often puzzled me, Marian's taking it so to heart, and all about a bit of a kiss which I wouldn't have took, if the Indian hadn't poked her lips close up to mine. Lord of mercy, I'd a gi all I'd got in a world to think it were true as you say. I have very little doubt of its being true. I have now seen your rival, and I think it altogether improbable she would of her own free will have preferred him to you. Thank ye, stranger. It's kind in you to say so. She's now married and gone. But if I thought there had been force used, I'd have done long ago what I mean to do now. "'What is that?' I asked, struck by the emphatic energy with which the last words were spoken. "'Foller him, if it be to the first end of the world. "'Yes, stranger, I mean it. I'll go arter him and track him out. "'I'll find him in the bottom of a California gold mine, or wherever he may try and hide himself. "'And by the eternal, I'll wipe out the score, both old and the new one, in the skunk's blood, "'or I'll never set foot again in the state of Tennessee. "'I've made up my mind to it. You are determined to follow him? Firmly determined. Enough. Our roads lie together. End of chapter 33。Chapter 34 of The Wild Huntress。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Megan Lamb. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter 34 A Departure in a Dugout. We were in perfect accord as to our course of action, as in our thoughts. If our motives were not similar, our enemy was the same. Only was there a difference in our perspective designs. Love was the lure that beckoned me on. Wingrove was led by revenge. To follow him and punish guilt was the metier of my companion. To follow her and rescue innocence was the role cast for me. Though guided by two such different passions, both were the strongest of our nature, either sufficient to stimulate to the most earnest action, 
and without loss of time we entered upon it in full determination to succeed i had already formed the design of pursuit and perhaps it was with the hope of obtaining an associate and companion that i had sought an interview with the hunter at all events this had been my leading idea his expressed determination therefore was but the echo of my wish it only remained for us to mould our design into a proper and practicable form though not much older than my new comrade there were some things in which i had the advantage of him i was his superior in experience he acknowledged it with all deference and permitted my counsels to take the lead the exercise of partisan warfare especially that practiced on the mexican and indian frontiers is a school scarcely equaled for training the mind to coolness and self-reliance an experience thus obtained had given mine such a cast and taught me by many a well-remembered lesson the truthfulness of what wise saw the more haste the less speed instead therefore of rushing at once in medius res and starting forth without knowing whither to go my counsel was that we should act with caution and adopt some definite plan of pursuit it was not the suggestion of my heart but rather of my head had i obeyed the promptings of the former i should have been in the saddle hours before and galloping somewhere in a westerly direction perhaps to find at the end of a long journey only disappointment and the infallibility of the adage taking counsel for my reason i advised a different course of action and my comrade whose head for his age was a cool one agreed to follow my advice indeed he had far less motive for haste than i revenge would keep and could be slept upon while with emotions such as mine a quiet heart was out of the question she whom i loved was not only in danger of being lost to me for ever but in danger of becoming the victim of a dastard coquin diabolical as dastard suffering under the sting of such a fearful apprehension it required me to exert all the self-restraining power of which i possessed had i but known where to go i should have rushed a horse and ridden on upon the instant not knowing i was fortunately possessed of sufficient prudence to restrain myself from the idle attempt that hold and daughter were gone and in the company with the mormon we knew the letter told that that they had left the cabin was equally known but whether they were yet clear from the neighborhood was still uncertain and to ascertain this was the first thing to be accomplished if still within the boundaries of the settlement or upon any of the roads leading from it there would be a chance of overtaking them but what after that ah beyond that i did not trust myself to speculate i dare not discuss the future i refrained from casting even a glance into its horoscope so dark did it appear i had but little hope that they were anywhere within reach that phrase of fatal prophecy you will be too late too late still rang in my ears it had a fuller meaning than might appear from a hasty interpretation of it had not it also a figurative application and did it not signify i should be too late in every sense at what time had they taken their departure by what route and upon what road these were the points to be ascertained and our only hope of obtaining a clue to them was by proceeding to the place of departure itself the deserted dwelling thither we hide in all haste prepared if need be for a more distant expedition on encountering the enclosure we dismounted and at once set about examining this sign my companion passed to and fro like a pointer in pursuit of a partridge i had hoped we might trace them by the tracks but this hope was abandoned on perceiving that the rain had obliterated every index of this kind even the hoof prints of my own horse made but an hour before were washed full of mud and scarcely traceable had they gone upon horseback it was not probable the house utensils could hardly have been transported that way nor yet could they have removed them in a wagon no road for wheels ran within miles of the clearing that to swampville as already stated being no more than a bridle path while the other traces leading up and down the creek were equally unavailable for the passage of a wheeled vehicle there was but one conclusion to which we could come and indeed we arrived at it without much delay they had gone off in a canoe it was clear as words or eyewitnesses could have made it wingrove well knew the craft it was known as holt's dugout and was occasionally used as a ferry boat to transport across the creek such stray travellers as passed that way it was sufficiently large to carry several at once large enough for the purpose of a removal 
the mode of their departure was the worst feature in the case, for although we had already been suspecting it, we had still some doubts. Had they gone off in any other way, there would have been a possibility of tracking them. But a conge in a canoe was a very different affair. Man's presence leaves no token upon the water. Like a bubble or a drop of rain, his traces vanish from the surface or sink into the depths of the subtle element, an emblem of his own vain nothingness. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Megan Lamb The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed Chapter 35 A Dangerous Sweetheart Our conjectures as to the mode of their departure were at an end. At this point, we had arrived at a definite knowledge. It was clear that they had gone off in the canoe, and with the current, of course, since they would carry them in the direction they intended to travel. The settling of this question produced a climax, a momentary pause in our action. We stood upon the bank of the stream, bending our eyes upon its course, and for a time giving way to the most gloomy reflections, like our thoughts were the waters troubled. Swollen by the recent rainstorm, the stream no longer preserved its crystal purity, but in the hue of the waters justified the name it bore. Brown and turbid, they rolled past no longer a stream but a rushing torrent that spumed against the banks as it surged impetuously onward. Trees torn up by the roots were carried on by the current, their huge trunks and half ribbon branches twisting and wriggling in the stream like drowning giants in their death struggle. In the sough of the torrent, we heard their sighs, in its roar, the groans of their departing spirits. The scene was in unison with our thoughts, and equally so with the laughter that, at that moment, sounded in our ears, for it was laughter wild and maniac. It was heard in the forest behind us, ringing among the trees, and mingling its shrill, unearthly echo with the roaring of the torrent. Both of us were startled at the sound. Though the voice was a woman's, I could tell that it had produced on Wingrove a certain impression of fear. On hearing it, he trembled and turned pale. I needed no explanation. A glance towards the forest revealed the cause. A female form moving among the trees told me whence had come that unexpected and ill-timed cachinnation. "'Lord, O oh mercy!' exclaimed my companion. "'That Injun again! She's been arter me since that night, and threatens to have a fresh try at taking my life. Look out, stranger. I know she's got pistols.' "'Oh, I fancy there's not much danger. She appears to be in the laughing mood.' It's just that ere larf I don't like. She is always worse when she's in that way. By this time, the Indian had reached the edge of the clearing very near the rear of the cabin. Without pausing, she sprang up on the fence, as if to enter the enclosure. This, however, proved not to be her intention, for, on climbing to the topmost rail, she stood erect upon it, with one hand clutching the limb of a tree to keep her in position. As soon as she had attained the upright attitude, another peal of laughter came ringing from her lips as wild as that with which she had announced her approach. But there was also in it tones a certain modulation that betokened scorn. Neither of us uttered a syllable, but observing a profound silence, stood waiting to hear what she had to say. Another scornful laugh, and her words broke forth. White eagle and proud slayer of red panthers, your hearts are troubled as the stream on which your eyes are gazing. Suani knows your sorrows. She comes to you with words of comfort. Ah, speak them then, said I, suddenly conceiving a hope. Hear you that sound in the forest? We heard no sound, save that of the water grumbling and surging at our feet. We answered in the negative. You hear it not? Ha 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 ha. Where are your ears? It is ringing in mine. All day I have heard it. Listen, there it is again. She's mocking us, muttered my companion. There ain't no sound in particular. No, we cannot hear it. You are mocking us, I rejoined, addressing myself to the brown skin sibyl. <laughs> it is it that is mocking you. It mocks you, and yet it is not the mocking bird. It is not the dove cooing gently to his mate, nor the screaming of the owl. It is the cuckoo that mocks you. <laughs> the cuckoo. 
Now, do you hear it, White Eagle? Do you hear it, proud slayer of red panthers? Ha! It mocks you both. Oh, bother, girl, exclaimed Wingrove in a vexed tone. You're talking nonsense. Truth, White Eagle, truth. The black snake has been in your nest, and yours too, slayer of panthers. He has wound himself around your pretty birds and borne them away in his coils, away over the great desert plains, away to the big lake. <laughs> in the desert, he will defile them. In the waters of the lake, he will drown them. <laughs> Them's your words of comfort, are they? cried Wingrove, exacerbated to a pitch of fury. Darn if I'll be such talk. I won't stand it any longer. Clear out now. We want no croak and raven here. Clear out, or... He was not permitted to finish the threat. I saw the girl suddenly drop down from her position on the fence and glide behind the trunk of a tree. Almost at the same instant, a light gleamed upon the bank, which might have been mistaken for a flash of lightning had it not been followed instantaneously by a quick crack, easily recognizable as the report of a pistol. I waited not to witness the effect, but rushed towards the tree with a design of intercepting the Indian. The blue smoke lingering in the damp air hindered me from seeing the movements of the girl. But, hurrying onward, I clambered over the fence. Once on the other side, I was beyond the cloud and could command a view for a score of yards or so around me. But in that circuit, no human form was to be seen. Beyond it, however, I heard the vengeful, scornful laugh pealing its unearthly echoes through the columned aisles of the forest. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M.B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter 36 The Horologe of the Dead Horse with inquiring eye and anxious heart, I turned towards the spot where I had left my companion. To my joy, he was still upon his feet and coming towards me. I could see blood dripping from his fingers and a crimson-stained rent in the sleeve of his buckskin shirt. But the careless air with which he was regarding it at once set my mind at rest. He was smiling. There could not be much danger in the wound. It proved so, in effect. The bullet had passed through the muscular part of the left forearm, only tearing the flesh. The wound did not even require a surgeon. The hemorrhage once checked, the dressing which my experience enabled me to give it was sufficient, and kept slung a few days would be certain to heal. Unpleasant as was the incident, it seemed to affect my companion far less than the words that preceded it. The allegorical allusions were but too well understood, and though they added but little to the knowledge already in his possession, that little produced a renewed acerbity of spirit. It affected me equally with my comrade, perhaps more. The figurative revelations of the Indian had put a still darker phase on the affair. The letter of Lillian spoke only of a far country, where gold was dug out of the sand. California, of course. There was no allusion to the Salt Lake, not one word about a migration to the metropolis of the Mormons. Suwanee's speech, on the other hand, clearly alluded to this place as the goal of the squatter's journey. How her information could have been obtained or whence derived was a mystery, and though loath to regard it as oracular, I could not divest myself of a certain degree of conviction that her words were true. The mind, ever prone to give assent to information conveyed by hints and innuendos, too often magnifies this gypsy knowledge, and dwells not upon the means by which it may have been acquired. For this reason gave I weight to the warnings of the brown-skinned Sibyl. Though uttered only to taunt, and too late to be of service, the incident altered our design, only so far as to urge us to its more rapid execution and without losing time we turned our attention once more to the pursuit of the fugitives the first point to be ascertained was the time of their departure if it want for the rain said the hunter i kid a told it by that there tracks they must a made some higher in the mud while toting our things to the dugout the darn rains washed em out every footmark of em but the horses what of them they could not have gone off in the canoe i war just thinking of them the one you seed with Stebbins must have been hard, I reckon, and from Kip's stables. Be like enough the skunk took him back the same night and then come again without him. Or Kip might have sent a nigger to fetch him. But Holt's own horse, the old critter, as you call him. 
that does need explaining he must have left him ahind he couldn't have took him in the dugout besides he wa'n't worth taking along the old thing war clean wore out and wouldn't have sold for his weight in corn shucks now what could they have done with him the speaker cast a glance around as if seeking for an answer ah he exclaimed pointing to some object on which he had fixed his glance yonder will find him see the buzzards that old hoss passed praying for i'll be bound it was as the hunter had conjectured a little outside the enclosure several vultures were seen upon the trees perched upon the lowest branches and evidently collected there by some object on the ground on approaching the spot the birds flew off with reluctance and the old horse was seen lying among the weeds under the shadow of a gigantic sycamore he was quite dead though still wearing his skin and a broad red disc in the dust opposite a gaping wound in the animal's throat showed that he had been slaughtered where he lay he's killed the critter musingly remarked my companion as he pointed to the gash just like what he do he might have left the old thing to some of his neighbors for all he war worth but it wouldn't have been hick holt that did it he wa'n't particular friendly with any of us and least of all with myself though i never knew the exact reason o't except i beat him once a shootin at a barbecue he war mighty proud o his shootin and i riled him i reckon he's been ugly with me ever since i scarcely heeded what the young hunter was saying my attention being occupied with the process of analytical reasoning in the dead horse i had found a key to the time of holt's departure the ground for some distance around where the carcass lay was quite dry the rain having been screened off by a large spreading branch of the sycamore that extended its leafy protection over the spot thus sheltered the body lay just as it had fallen and the crimson rivulet with its terminating pool had only been slightly disturbed by the feet of the buzzards the marks of whose claws were traceable in the red mud as was that of their beaks upon the eyeballs of the animal all these were signs which the experience of a prairie campaign had taught me how to interpret and which the forest lore of my backwoods comrade also enabled him to read at the first question put to him he comprehended my meaning how long think you since he was killed i asked pointing to the dead horse ha you're right stranger said he perceiving the object of the interrogatory i were slack not to think of that we can easy find out i reckon the hunter bent down over the carcass so as to bring his eyes close to the red gash in the neck in this he placed the tips of his fingers and kept them there he uttered not a word but held his head slantwise and steadfast as if listening only for a few seconds did he remain in this attitude and then as if suddenly satisfied with the examination he rose from his stooping posture exclaiming as he stood erect good by thunder the old horse hain't been dead above a couple of hours look like a stranger the blood ain't froze i kin most fancy thar's heat in his old carcass yet are you sure he has been killed this morning oh quite sure and at most three or maybe four are gone see thar he continued raising one of the limbs and letting it drop again limber as an eel if he'd a been dead last night that leg had been stiff long afore this quite true replied i convinced as was my companion that the horse had been slaughtered that morning this bit of knowledge was an important contribution towards fixing the time of the departure it told the day the hour was of less importance to our plans though to that by a further process of reasoning we were enabled to make a very near approximation holt must have killed the horse before going off and the act as both of us believed could not have been accomplished at a very early hour as far as the sign enabled us to tell not more than four hours ago and perhaps about two before the time of my first arrival in the clearing whether the squatter had left the ground immediately after the performance of this rude sacrifice it was impossible to tell there was no sign by which to determine the point but the probability was that the deed was done just upon the eve of departure and that the slaughter of the old horse was the closing act of holt's career in his clearing upon mud creek only one doubt remained was it he who had killed the animal i had conceived a suspicion pointing to suwanee but without being able to attribute to the indian any motive for the act now no replied my comrade in answer to my interrogatory on this head twar holt hisself sartin he couldn't a take the old horse along with him and he didn't want anybody else to get him besides a girl he'd no reason to a did it she'd a been more likely to a took the old critter to thar camp seeing he were left behind with nobody to own him though he wa'n't worth more'n what the skin ud fetch him he'd a done for them our injuns well enough for carrying thar traps and things no twa'n't her nor anybody else cept and holt hisself he did it 
if that be so comrade there is still hope for us they cannot have more than four hours the start you say the creek has a winding course crooked as a coon's hind leg and the obion most part of same it curls through the bottom like the tail of a cur dog and nigher the mississippi it don't move faster than a snail would crawl i reckon they run of the river it'll not help em much they have a good spell of paddling afore they get down the mississippi and i hope that dern mormon will blister his ugly claws at it with all my heart i rejoined and both of us at the same instant recognizing the necessity of taking time by the forelock we hurried back to our horses sprang into our saddles and started along the trace conducting to the mouth of the obion End of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter thirty seven a lookout from aloft it cost us a fatiguing ride of nearly twelve hours duration most of it along by roads and bridle paths at intervals passing through tracts of swampy soil where our horses sank to the saddle girths in mud we rode continuously stopping only once to recruit our horses at one of the stands or isolated log hostelries which are found upon old traces connecting the sparse settlements of the backwoods it was the only one we saw upon our route and at it we remained no longer than was absolutely necessary to rest our wearied steeds and put them in a condition for the completion of the journey we knew the necessity of haste our only hope lay in being able to reach the mouth of the obion before the canoe could pass out of it otherwise our journey would be in vain and we should not only have our long ride for nothing but would be under the necessity of doubling the distance by riding back again along the route we found time to discuss the circumstances both those in our favour and against us the waterway taken by the canoe was far from being direct both the creek and the larger stream curved repeatedly in their courses and in ordinary times were of sluggish current the freshet however produced by the late rainstorm had rendered it swifter than common and we knew that the canoe would be carried down with considerable rapidity faster than we were travelling on horseback on such roads for so great a distance fast travelling was impossible and could only have been accomplished at the risk of killing our horses mounted as i was i might have made more of the time but i was under the necessity of slackening my pace for my companion whose sorry steed constantly required waiting for our sole chance lay in our route being shorter and in the circumstance that the fugitives had not a very long start of us but for all this the issue was exceedingly doubtful and by the nicest calculations we were satisfied we should have but little margin to spare i need hardly point out the importance of our arriving in time should the canoe get beyond the mouth of the obion without our seeing it we should be left undetermined as to whether they had gone up the mississippi or down and therefore altogether without a guide as to our future movements in fact we should be unable to proceed further in the pursuit so far as the mouth of the obion their route was fixed and of course ours was also determined but beyond it would be on our part mere blind guessing and should evil chance conduct us in the wrong direction the result would be ruin to our prospects on the other hand could we but arrive in time if only to see the canoe entering the great river and note which turning it took our purpose would be accomplished that is our present purpose for beyond that of ascertaining their route of travel across the plains and their point of destination i had formed no plans to follow them wherever they might go even to the distant shores of the pacific to seek them wherever they might settle to settle beside them beside her these were the ideas i had as yet but vaguely conceived all ulterior designs were contingent on the carrying out of these and still shrouded under the clouded drapery of the ambiguous future the purposes of my travelling companion differed slightly from mine and were perhaps a little more definite his leading idea was a settlement of old scores with stebbins for wrongs done to him which he now more particularly detailed to me they were sufficiently provocative of revenge and from the manner of my comrade and the vows he occasionally uttered i could perceive that he would be as eager in the pursuit as myself in all probability an encounter with the migrating party would bring about an important change in their programme since the young hunter was determined as he expressed himself 
to force a darn skunk into a foot inspired by such motives we pressed on to the end of our journey and reached the mouth of the obion after a long and wearisome ride it was midnight when we arrived upon the shore of the mississippi at its point of confluence with the tennessean stream the land upon which we stood was scarcely elevated above the surface of the water and covered every foot of it with a forest of cottonwood poplar and other water-loving trees these extending along the marshy borders of both streams hindered us from having a view of their channels to obtain this it was necessary to climb one of the trees and my comrade being disabled the task devolved on me dismounting i chose one that appeared easiest of ascent and clambering up it as high as i could get i fixed myself in a fork and commenced duty as a vidette my position could not have been better chosen it afforded me a full view not only of the obion's mouth but also of the broad channel into which it emptied at their confluence forming an expanse of water that but for its rolling current might have been likened to a vast lake there was moonlight over the whole surface and the erratic ripples were reflected in sparkling coruscations scarcely to be distinguished from the gleaming of the lightning bugs that hovered in myriads along the hedges of the marsh both banks of the lesser stream were draped to the water's edge with an unbroken forest of cottonwoods the tops of which exhibiting their characteristic softness of outline were unstirred by the slightest breeze between rolled the brown waters of the obion in ruder grander flow and with channel extended by the freshet every inch of it from side to side was under my observation so completely that i could distinguish the smallest object that might have appeared upon its surface not even the tiniest waif could have escaped me much less a canoe freighted with human beings and containing that fairer form that would be certain to secure the keenest and most eager glances of my eye i congratulated myself on reaching this perch i perceived that a better post of observation could not have been chosen it was complete for the purpose and if i could only have felt sure that we had arrived in time all would have been satisfactory time alone would determine the point and turning my eyes upstream i entered upon my earnest vigil End of chapter 37chapter thirty eight of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter thirty eight the white fog vain vigil it proved i shall not tire the reader with details suffice it to say that we kept watch till morning's dawn and then profiting by the daylight sought out a more convenient post of observation where we continued our surveillance watching and sleeping in turn throughout the following day and into the second was our vigil extended until no longer able to hope against hope we agreed finally to abandon it but for one circumstance we might have felt surprise at the result we were both convinced that we had reached the river's mouth in good time since by our calculations the canoe could not possibly have headed us but for the same circumstance we might have believed that they had not yet come down the obion and perhaps would have remained at our post a day longer the explanation is this on the first night of our watch a few hours after having taken my station in the tree a fog had suddenly arisen upon the rivers shrouding the channels of both it was the white fog a well-known phenomena of the mississippi that often extends its dangerous drapery over the bosom of the father of waters a thing of dread even to the skilled pilots who navigate this mighty stream on that particular night the fog lay low upon the water so that in my position near the top of the tree i was entirely clear of its vapory disk and could look down upon its soft filmy cumuli floating gently over the surface white and luminous under the silvery moonlight the moon was still shining brightly and both sky and forest could be seen as clearly as ever the water surface alone was hidden from my sight the very thing i was most anxious to observe as if by some envious demon of the flood this curtain seemed to have been drawn for just as the fog had fairly unfurled itself i fancied i could hear the dipping of a paddle at no great distance off in the channel of the stream moreover gazing intently into the mist as yet thin and filmy i fancied i saw a long dark object on the surface with the silhouettes of human forms outlined above it just as of a canoe on profile with passengers in it i even noted the number of the upright forms three of them which exactly corresponded to that of the party we were expecting 
so certain was i at that moment of seeing all this that i need not have shouted to assure myself excited with over-eagerness i did so and hailed the canoe in hopes of obtaining an answer my summons produced not the desired effect on the contrary it seemed to still the slight plashing i had heard and before the echoes of my voice died upon the air the dark objects had glided out of sight having passed under the thick masses of the floating vapour over and over i repeated my summons each time changing the form of speech and each time with like fruitless effect the only answer i received was from the blue heron that startled by my shouts rose screaming out of the fog and flapped her broad wings close to my perch upon the tree whether the forms i had seen were real or only apparitions conjured up by my excited brain they vouchsafed no reply and in truth in the very next moment i inclined to the belief that my senses had been deceiving me from that time my comrade and i were uncertain and this uncertainty will explain the absence of our surprise at not seeing the canoe and why we waited no longer for its coming the most probable conjectures were that it had passed us in the fog that the apparition was real and they that occupied the canoe were now far away on the mississippi no longer trusting to such a frail craft but passengers on one of the numerous steamboats that by night as by day and in opposite directions we had seen passing the mouth of the obion in all likelihood then the fugitives were now beyond the limits of tennessee and we felt sufficiently assured of this but the more important point remained undetermined whether they had gone northward or southward whether by the routes of the missouri or those of the arkansas upon this question we were as undecided as ever at that season of the year the probabilities were in favour of the southern route but it depended on whether the emigrants intended to proceed at once across the plains or wait for the return of spring i knew moreover that the mormons had their own trains and ways of travelling and that several new routes or trails had been discovered during the preceding year by military explorers emigrants for oregon and california and by the mormons themselves this knowledge only complicated the question leaving us in hopeless doubt and indecision thus unresolved it would have been absurd to proceed further our only hope lay in returning to swampville and whence this hope what was to be expected in swampville who was there in that village of golden dreams to guide me upon the track of my lost love no one no human being the index of my expectation was not a living thing but a letter assuredly i had not forgotten that promise so simply yet sweetly expressed if i thought you would like to know where we are gone i would write to you and again if you will allow me i will send a letter to swampville from the first place we come to to tell you where we are going oh that i could have told her how much i would like to know and how freely she had my permission to write alas that was impossible but the contingencies troubled me not much i was full of hope that she would waive them communicating this hope to my companion we rode back to swampville with the design of laying siege to the post-office until it should surrender up to us the promised epistle. End of chapter 38